Amen. Well, it's mid-November already, and it's getting cold, as you may have noticed in the morning, and it's going to get colder. And i got to say that I don't really like that. I know the frost looks beautiful when you get up in the morning. I know the snow is pretty when it first falls. I know that snowshoeing and skiing and ice fishing and snowmobiling and making so all these things are lots of fun and great and, and they're a great deal of fun and all the more so if you have grandkids with you while you participate in them. And so I'm not against frost and I'm not against snow. I just wish that if I could have my way, it would be plus 15 when it snowed and not zero, you know. And if I could have my way, it would never get lower than plus 15. You know, it would get down to about 15 degrees, maybe mid to late December, and we'd get some snow and enjoy a nice white Christmas, and then it'd come right back up to 20 to 25 where it belongs. Of course, that's just me. And you'll be glad, no doubt, that uh, the Lord, uh, that I get my directions from him, and he doesn't get directions from me, <laughs> or we would probably never have winter. Glory to God. But here in Canada, when the weather gets too inclement outside, we come inside where we can control the weather. Where by the miracle of modern heating systems, we can change the temperature at will. And if you can find a thermostat, you can turn the thermostat up, and you can find out that it gets a little bit warmer, a little bit cooler in the summer if you have air conditioning. And you can alter the interior climate at will. You just have to find the thermostat. Or if you're renting, you ask your landlord to find the thermostat. Move it from the off setting where you left it last summer to the heat setting and crank the temperature to something that you find a little more comfortable. And then assuming that you have a good heating system and good repair, assuming you've kept up to date with your Kingston Utilities uh, bill, then the system will fire up and it will soon be much more comfortable. Changing the physical climate inside our buildings is something that every Canadian believes in. Amen? From that regard, we all believe in climate change. But changing the climate outside is not quite so simple as finding a thermostat and cranking it up. This Evergreen, at Evergreen, which is our seniors ministry, this past May, I gave a short talk about exterior climate change, about global climate change. And I expressed a biblical view of climate change. And if you weren't here for that, you can email the church office. The email address is on your bulletin. And they will be glad to send you a PDF of that talk, and you can read it as you see fit. And so as we continue in the Spirit-Filled Life series, I'm not going to preach about global climate change. You can read that on your own as you have opportunity. But we are going to find, as we continue in our Spirit-Filled Life series, that the Scripture speaks to us about a kind of climate change, about changing the spiritual climate, about how all those who have the Spirit-Filled Life can go changing the spiritual thermostat of the place that they are in, the community that they abide in. And this is within our grasp. You and I can do this. We have the ability to change the spiritual thermostat. And as we continue in Acts 2 in our study, we're going to find the disciples doing exactly that. But before we open our Bibles, as is our habit here at KAT, let's one more time come to the throne of grace and ask for His favor. Father, now as we open our Bibles, we turn one more time again, Lord, as we so often seem to do, to a very familiar passage to most of us. Something we've read many times in the past, something we may have even heard preached on many times in the past. But Lord, you have something new here for us. You have called us to come together, to gather, to speak to us. And Lord, you speak to us through the prayer. You speak to us through the video. You speak to us through the music. You speak to us, Father, through the, the, the biblical acts, through the baptism. You speak to us through all these different kinds of things and through our fellowship. But Lord, speak also through your word, we pray. Let your word have its full impact. So we say, come Holy Spirit. Take these words, this text, off the pages. Make it alive to us, fresh and new. Fill us with the excitement, Lord God, of, your, of the climate of heaven. As we look at these things, we give you praise for what you are about to do in each of our lives. Amen. Amen. So, use the Pew Bible as you have opportunity, or your own Bible if you brought one. 
and turn to the book of Acts. We are continuing in our study, The Spirit for Life, in the book of Acts. We're in Acts 2. At this point, we're at the end of Acts 2. We've spent eight full weeks looking at the leading up to and the pouring out of the Holy Spirit on the disciples of Jesus Christ. And we've spent weeks since then looking at the corporate Spirit-filled church and being reminded by our district superintendent last week that we are a Spirit-filled denomination meant to be full of Spirit-filled people. And we all can be that as we earnestly seek His face and ask. And in Acts 2, the early church is exactly that. A group of spirit-filled people on spiritual fire for the mission of God. Praise the Lord. And this is what it says about them, starting in Acts 2, verse 42. Follow along. It says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Amen. Now, there's a lot in this passage, and we've already heard two messages on this passage, and this much we can know for sure, that we're not going to exhaust this passage today. The words of the Lord spoken through the Holy Spirit here are unlimited. His word is timeless, and it's ever able to edify us, to exhort us, to encourage us to walk in the way of the Lord. And so let us know that we can keep coming back to this passage as often as you will, and find new things. And let us recall then that by the context of this scripture passage today, the believers are together, being led by God, by the Holy Spirit, and they're prioritizing the, the preaching of the gospel. They're prioritizing the good news, and more are being added to their number day by day, it says. They're devoted to welcoming other people into the kingdom of God, to making disciples, to purposeful gathering, to biblical practice, and to prayer. And we dug into those activities back on November the 3rd. Let's notice today, though, that such focus and such devotion yields a result. It yields a result as they continue that. Uh, something is happening here. Four things, actually. Four things are happening as the Spirit-filled disciples gather and devote themselves to God's purpose, as they grow as disciples of Jesus Christ and welcome newcomers into the kingdom of our Lord. Notice says that Scripture says that as they did that, it brought about a climate of awe. A climate of awe. The study passage says everyone was filled with awe. And the Greek word Luke uses here is phobos. But this is not phobos as we use the term today. Today we, we hear that term and we think of the word phobia. A modern use of that word is a, means an irrational fear. But in the biblical sense that Luke is using it, it means a very rational fear. Not an irrational fear, but a rational fear. It means a profound respect. A profound respect. A respect at what? It says everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. Notice that they're not filled with awe at the apostles themselves. These are just regular men. Ordinary people, just like you and I. They're not filled with awe at the apostles, but at the wonders and signs happening in their midst. The people are recognizing the presence of God and the power of God right there with them. They're recognizing the presence of God and the power of God, and as they practice the Spirit-filled life, they're gaining a profound respect for the Lord. Praise the Lord. Have you ever felt that? Have you ever walked into a gathering of other Christ uh, followers, and you come into this room full of saints, and as you enter this room, you just know, you know God is there. God is moving there. 
God is working right there. The Spirit speaking to people right then and right there. And as you walk into the room, you, you, you have this tremendous sense of awe. God is there. I trust you remember such times. I can think of them often. I think times uh, that I've seen in the past where you walk in and there's this sense of the presence and the sense of the power of God and the atmosphere itself seems transformational. People start getting saved. People are getting healed. People are bowing their knees in repentance. And the place may just be a building or perhaps a tree in the middle of the field just a few hours ago, just a regular ordinary place. But as the God's people gathered and as they worshipped and as they sought His face, this, the holy atmosphere of heaven seems to descend upon them. And the barrier between heaven and earth gets thin. And those present seem to breathe faith more than they breathe oxygen. And then healing and deliverance and wonder and sign and all these things suddenly become possible. I think every prayer ministry trip I've ever been on at such a time. You get up and you have a quiet time of reflection and personal prayer. And then you gather with the team and you sing songs of devotion. And you study the word together. And have a great time of prayer. Praying through the agenda. And by 10 in the morning, you're out prayer walking through the streets. Before noon, you're gathered in a circle, listening to someone tell their story, gathering around them, putting your hands on their shoulders, and you pray for them. And as you do that, the atmosphere of the room is changed. You're now in a holy place. Suddenly, it's a sacred time. It is though God Himself came into the room, walked outward to the spiritual thermostat, and cranked it. And the Spirit of God fills us as one another prays. And you find yourself physically where you were just a moment ago, but somehow, suddenly you're in the kingdom of God with both feet firmly in His kingdom. And words of knowledge and prophecies get spoken. And people get delivered. And people get healed. And relationships get reconciled. And those there get filled with a sense of awe. God is there. Praise the Lord. You know, that's the atmosphere that we want to create every Sunday. That's the atmosphere that every member of our church leadership, every ministry leader, every member of this church earnestly seeks to have here in this place. It's the climate change that we bring about as we worship the Lord climate change that we pray for earnestly as worship songs are, are prayed through and chosen as they're practiced and as they're sung. As we participate in the, with the Lord in bringing about a climate of awe where the before it was just an empty space. But now by the, by the participation of God's people with His purposes there is a climate of awe. Praise the Lord. I hope you sense something of that now. I hope you caught something of God's smile as Jonathan went through the waters of baptism. I hope you sensed God's joy as we worship the Lord in these songs of, of praise, these glad songs of praise that we sang today. I hope you felt His touch as we prayed together. And I hope and I pray that you know God's presence with you every time we gather as His people. Whether that's here or in your home. Whether that's here or in a small group. When you gather, wherever there's two or three, God is there in the midst. Accomplishing His purposes. As we practice the Spirit-filled life together. The study passage says all the believers were together. It says they gathered regularly to enjoy this. They couldn't just experience this once and say, well, I've experienced it. I've been there. I've done that. I got the ticket. No, no, no. They wanted to experience it again and again. They wanted to live in that. And so every day, it says, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. Notice that. Every day, it says. Not once a week. Not every now and again. And, and um, you know, one has to be 
you know, think this through, probably not everybody could gather every day because people would have had other obligations. They would have had work obligations, family obligations. They would have had to go away for blocks of time. But they had this deep sense of fellowship. This, they wanted to commune with the living God, and so they, they desired to gather as often as they possibly could together. And that desire drew them together to experience the presence and power of God. And so they did it often. Not once or twice a month. As often as they could, they gathered. You know, I read that and I immediately think of the, the first few weeks after I got saved. How I was so enraptured with this idea that as God's people gathered, God was there with them. And I remember every time I stepped foot into a church, I saw all my brothers and sisters there, and I was filled with awe. I was filled with this wonderful sense of love, the sweet sense of God's presence, and it drew me back again and again. As often as they opened the doors, I wanted to be there. Because as often as I did, I encountered something of the Lord. Something of Him. I heard something of Him in the conversations in the foyer. I heard His voice to me as a brother or sister spoke in the worship service, in the prayer, in the time after, in the fellowship that we had. And as I read our study passage, I consider how this building, this very building you're in right now, was full of people on Monday. Storehouse of Hope was operating at full capacity, 93 people this past Monday. Monday evening was Bridges downstairs. There was a mission team meeting upstairs. Tuesday was the VON exercise group in the gym. The office busy with activity throughout the day. The Mark Bible study downstairs that afternoon. The Sanctuary Women's Prayer upstairs the same afternoon. A WANA and membership meeting, or a mentorship meeting that same evening. Tuesday was a day packed with ministry. People were here morning to evening. Wednesday was Ladies Cafe, mid-morning. Bridges Bible Study that afternoon. Thursday, Men's Prayer, first thing in the morning. VON and Storehouse again. Saturday morning was Prep for Storehouse. An afternoon joint prayer outreach with KPF. And then KPF's worship service last night. And here we are again on Sunday. Pressing cycle, repeat. Let's do it again. Let's worship the Lord together again. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord for life in the temple of God. And as often as you come here, I hope you come pregnant with the expectation that you're not just meeting brothers and sisters, you're coming to meet the Lord. You're coming to hear His voice. You're coming to be transformed, to be made a little bit more like Him. Maybe you come here for some activity. Maybe you come because of some program that's running. But God plans to meet you every time you come. You've got to know that. God plans to meet you when you come to His house. And the conversations you have, they're not random conversations. They're not meaningless conversations. They are God's opportunity to speak through you, to speak to you. The activities you do here are not just an occupation of your time and talent. They are being used of God to touch others for His name and for His glory. Every time two or more are gathered, there the Lord is to do His will. And every time we gather, there the Holy Spirit is, His presence and His power right here with us. And in the midst of that prayerful gathering, purposeful gathering, in the midst of that unity, bracketed between these two statements about being together for that purpose, what do we see? Right in the middle, look how Scripture observes that in between those statements, it says they had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Let's read that together, the blue text. They had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. They sacrificed some of what they had simply to benefit another. Simply to benefit another. They divested themselves of their excess riches so that those who lacked might have what was necessary. So they didn't just have fellowship together. They purposely gathered to worship God and to love each other. 
to love God and to love each other. Because only love sacrifices and gives for the sake of the other without any concern at all for the benefit of oneself. So the Spirit-filled church has a climate of awe and a climate of love. They experience the presence and power of God in the drawing them together, and that climate is a climate of love that keeps drawing them together. A climate of love that keeps drawing them together. They had everything in common, no doubt not to the same level. It's not like they said, oh, let's pool all our resources and then divide it all out by the number of people present. That's not what they're doing. Some had enough to sell, and some had nothing except their need to be filled. But they all shared that none might lack. No one had needs that went completely unmet. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone, it says, who had need. So all were being provided for. No one's being left out. It's not like, hey, I get to come and I get to enjoy the kingdom. Too bad for you. No, no, no. I get to enjoy the kingdom. And part of the kingdom is is me blessing you. That's why they came. They're being provided for. They're being fed. It says they broke bread and ate together. So all are being fed. All are being provided for. All are being loved and cared for. They're literally practicing what Jesus said is the most important thing. Remember when someone came to him and said, what are the, what's the greatest commandment? What's the most important thing to do? Do you remember what Jesus said? Matthew 22. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, he added. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. And this is exactly what the Spirit-filled church does. This is exactly what they're practicing. Loving God by worshiping Him with all of who they are and all of what they have and loving each other in exactly the same way. Loving each other in exactly the same way with gifts, and with sacrifice, because that's how love expresses itself. Love expresses itself with gift and with sacrifice. The gift of time, the sacrifice of time, the gift and sacrifice of talent, and the gift and sacrifice of treasure. Because when one loves, one recognizes that we've been freely given love in all things by God, and so you freely give. And in as many words, you could say, They practice the economy of God. They practice the economy of God. God's economy doesn't run on gold and silver, you know. It doesn't run on pesos and rubles, on dollars and euros. It runs on gift, and it runs on sacrifice. The kingdom of heaven is a kingdom where the climate of love permeates every day, and it might be sunny and warm out. But the climate is one of love and of loving God and loving each other. And so you give to each other. The spiritual temperature is so high that one seeks to honor the other more than oneself. And so though it's cold cold and cloudy out, the climate is one of love and sacrificing what one has so that the other can benefit. Because here in the very presence of God Most High, what difference does temporary things matter anyways? when the eternal is right here with us. Praise the Lord. You know, most of us came in today into this room wearing at least two layers of clothes because it's cold. And so maybe you have a t-shirt and a shirt on, as I do, or a shirt and a sweater. Maybe you came in with a shirt and a jacket. I don't know, but you came in and you found out that it's nice and warm in here. And so it wasn't too long before you take off your jacket. Or you take off your sweater. And when you did, you felt better, didn't you? Felt a little more comfortable. Friends, that's what it's like when the spiritual temperature of the church goes up. You feel better when you take off some of your excess and you feel all the more better, if I can use that phrase, you feel all the more better when what you take off helps someone else. Praise the Lord. When God can work through you to bless someone else, you feel better and they feel better. I'll never forget Reverend Dr. Ed Silvoza telling me that the best indication, he said, of the kingdom of God is a lack. A 
a lack. Not a lack as in poverty, but a lack of poverty. So that's the best indication that the kingdom is there. A lack of poverty. No one has an unmet need. Even from your first step in the kingdom, he pointed out, you find your spiritual poverty immediately alleviated. Praise be to the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Amen? Amen. Ephesians 1. Every spiritual blessing. None of us are spiritually poor. We're all spiritually rich. If you've called on Christ, you are spiritually rich. He who had nothing has made us wealthy. Praise the Lord. And you come to church and you find your relational poverty completely alleviated. Because Jesus gives you a relationship with our Father in heaven. And he says, whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. And over and over and over again in the scripture, we're told that we are brothers and sisters. We're on equal footing. We're peers. We're part of the family of God, siblings with one another. So there's no spiritual poverty in the kingdom of God. There's no relational poverty in the kingdom of God. Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you, a place built without human hands. There's no accommodation poverty in the kingdom of God. And what of every other kind of poverty? Scripture says, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? All things. Praise the Lord. The best indication of the kingdom of God made real in our present world is the absence of poverty. For this reason, we have a benevolent fund. So far this year, our benevolent fund has significantly helped eight members of our congregation. Brothers and sisters, giving for the sake of the other. Praise the Lord. And that's on top of the work of storehouse, which feeds over 100 people a week. That's on top of of, of the work that they do helping dozens and dozens of families with clothing. That's on top of all the other outreach that we do as a church. That's on top of the outreach to the vulnerable population that Bridges does, that we help facilitate through the use of our building. And yet we want to do more. Amen? We want to do more because we want to love each other. We want to demonstrate that love to each other because that's what the kingdom is about. We want to demonstrate love to all who consider this their church home and to all who access our programs and services. And we want to maintain and increase a climate of love. Notice too that our study passage says they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Glad and sincere hearts. The Greek there is agale, agale asis. Agale asis. I'm Completely butchering that. You can ask Paul how to pronounce it later. The English minimizes the original meaning, though, because in ancient Greek it means extreme joy, overflowing exuberance. That's what it means. At District Retreat last week, someone defined this kind of joy as the feeling you get when you walk into a room full of people and you find that they are all completely overjoyed to see you. Have you ever experienced that? You walk into a room and everybody there is like, yay! I hope you get to experience that. At least once. It's fantastic. It's the joy of finding a soul rescued from damnation. Not just rescued, but blessed beyond all understanding. It's the joy of finding a long-lost relative, safe and secure. It's the joy of finding a friend when you most need a friend and you find someone who really cares about you. It's the joy of finding peace at last. It's the joy of finally finding a place to belong to. A family that you can call your own. A loving Father who will love and care and protect you. A place and a family and a Father to belong to. To have gladness in the core of who you are. And, and, and we should rejoice, friends, because we have it. We have this in the kingdom of God. We have joy and we have gladness. We have peace in the kingdom of God. And we already have it right now, right here in the Spirit-filled church. Glad and sincere hearts. Sincere there is a fellow taste in the original language. It means simpleness. It means calmness, smoothness, 
The picture there is of a, a river without a rock in it, flowing without a ripple on the surface. Serenity, calmness, the polar opposite of this frantic pace of life that our society lives, chasing after what does not satisfy. The atmosphere in the kingdom of God is joy and contentment, gladness, humble simplicity. It is a climate of peace and a climate of joy. A climate of peace and a climate of joy. And that's why, friends, we want to belong to a spirit-filled church. You want to belong there. You want to live there. You don't just want to visit that place. You want to be part of it. So that every time you come, you can not only experience peace and joy yourself, but you can bring peace and joy to someone else. What a blessing that is. To bring such joy, such sweet contentment to someone else, to a brother in Christ or a sister in Christ. And you and I can do this because God blesses us so that we can be a blessing. Blessed with the character and spirit of God to be a blessing. Best, blessed with the word of God to be a blessing. Blessed with the Holy Spirit to be a blessing. Blessed with Him to freely give Him and ourselves to another. Blessed to give the blessing of a listening ear. Blessed to bear one another's burdens. Blessed to help carry the load of someone who's suffering. So the church has a climate of awe, a climate of love, a climate of peace and joy. One more. One more atmospheric condition that they bring about because of their devotion, because of their gathering to do the purposes of God as the Spirit of God centers in their midst. Look at verse 47. It says they were praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So there's praise, there's songs, there's worship, and there's favor. Because everyone who looks can see that there is something that's good. Something that's good. Good for all those who are there and good for those who are not yet there. That's a good place to go. Because it's good there. It's a highly attractive environment. A highly attractive environment. Not because of their programs. Not because they say, oh, we, we offer this. It's not because they have cookies. It's a highly attractive environment because the Spirit-filled church offers the presence of God. Because the Spirit-filled church offers love and awe and joy and peace because it's a place to belong to. A place of gladness and worship. A place of praise and exuberant singing of joy. A place to grow rich in spirit and rich in relationship. A place to grow rich in belonging. A place to grow rich in the knowledge and the application of Scripture. Praise the Lord. A place to grow in Christ. A place to grow in Christ. I want to be part of that. I want to be part of that. I hope you want to be part of that too. A place to grow in Christ. A spirit-filled church is a gathering of spirit-filled people. People who are dripping with the presence and power of God. People who preach the full package of the gospel of Jesus Christ. People who center themselves in prayer. Who make united, concerted, extraordinary prayer a way of life such that they're constantly being filled and being refilled and refilled again and again with the Holy Spirit. And because they're so baptized by the Spirit's presence, they're devoted to God's ways and God's purpose. Devoted to welcoming others to the kingdom. Devoted to making disciples by purposeful gathering. Devoted to biblical practice. Devoted to loving God and loving each other. And as a result, they create a climate that doesn't belong in this world. A climate of heaven right here on earth. A climate of heaven right here on earth. I want you to say that all again. Because I want us to catch this vision. Because I want us to see that this is already here in part. But also to catch the vision that God would have so much more of this. 
And he's been speaking to us all through this sermon series. All this time from the first message we had on September the 8th, right through here today to November 17th. All this time God has been with us. God has been speaking to us, shouting to us, talking to us, imparting His Spirit to us. Ministering by His presence among us so that we would become more and more of the church that He means for us to be and to become. The Spirit-filled church is a gathering of Spirit-filled people. People dripping with the presence and power of God. People who preach the full package of the Gospel of Christ. People who center themselves in prayer. Who make united, concerted, extraordinary prayer a way of life so that they can constantly be filled and be refilled by the Holy Spirit of God. People who are so baptized by His presence that they're devoted, sold out, one would say, to God's ways and purpose. Devoted to welcoming others into the kingdom of God. Devoted to making disciples, purposeful gathering, and biblical practice. Devoted to loving God and loving each other. And as a result, they create a climate, not of this world, but the climate of heaven. Climate of awe, climate of love, climate of peace and joy. A highly attractive climate because it is the climate that God made us to live in forever and ever. That's what the kingdom of God is. That's what's coming when Christ comes back. And that's what we have to practice until He comes back. That's the climate God has for you and for me. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Oh Lord, You are so very gracious. So very gracious to us. Lord, we are undeserving. We were Your enemy. And yet you died for us. While we were your enemies, while we were actively disobeying you, while we were actively dishonoring your name, you sacrificed yourself for us. You didn't wait till we repented to do that. You did it in advance. Because you loved us. And you wanted to make sure there was a way back to yourself. So you did that. And Lord, to this day, from this day till the day you come back we want to be the spirit filled people that you call each of us to be we want to be the spirit filled church on mission with you breathing the air of heaven and bringing the air of heaven everywhere we go to everyone we speak to as often as we gather for you Lord are worthy You are worthy of this kind of life. You are worthy of all of our worship. We give you praise and we give you glory for what you've done, what you're doing, and what you will yet do. We honor you.